They don't come here to attack us because we're rich and we're free. They come and they, and they attack us because we're over there. We don't need to go populist left or populist right. We don't need to embrace neo-Marxism or neo-fascism, these disastrous movements from the 20th century. Turns out the answer is pretty much our Bill of Rights, our story. Embrace freedom. That's the answer. And if the LP has a purpose, it's not to put people to sleep. It's to wake them up. We're here because we love liberty. And we're here because we hate injustice. We are here to save mankind. We are here to fight. Join us, the Libertarian Party, in perhaps the most exciting, grandest endeavor in history, the restoration of American liberty. Ideas spread, they can't stop them. An idea whose time has come cannot be stopped by any army or any government. Hello and welcome to episode 62 of Decentralized Revolution, a podcast from the Libertarian Party Mises Caucus and Mises PAC. I'm Aaron Harris and I'm your host. Returning to the show today, Kyle Anzalone. He's the assistant editor over at antiwar.com and the news editor over at the Libertarian Institute with our friends Scott Horton, uh, Pete Quinones, and the great Sheldon Richmond. Uh, he's, uh, Kyle is also the co-host along with Will Porter of the excellent Conflicts of Interest podcast. Uh, today, a pretty straightforward episode. I, I wanted to get Kyle's take on the Afghanistan withdrawal, which seems to have gotten lots and lots of attention just from normal people. I heard a lot of uh, uh, people in my life who aren't political uh, talking about it. Um, most of what they had to say seemed to be, you know, heavily influenced by the neocon, uh, you know, mainstream uh, deep state view of things. So I just wanted to get a more accurate non-propagandistic analysis of Afghanistan uh, you know, why Biden went ahead and did it when a lot of us uh, uh, libertarians thought he might not. Uh, also wanted to get a hit Kyle's take on the Biden administration in general and uh, Kyle's take on the future of Taiwan and uh, the rest of that part of the world, uh, not just because I have family in Taiwan, but uh, because uh, I think the military industrial complex might now see the China theater as a, a source of their future profits over the next uh, 20 or so years. Uh, details on some of the stuff we talk about are over at decentralizedrevolution.com slash 62. Now on to my talk with Kyle Anzalone. Kyle Anzalone, welcome to Decentralized Revolution. Oh, you know what? Um, Go ahead. My, my, uh, my audio isn't coming through my headphones. I'm sorry. Let That's me okay. see if I switch this. All right. Can you say something? Sure. Can you hear oh, me? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. I wasn't sure if it'd give you any feedback or anything, so. No, I'm okay. Yep. All right. All right. Kyle Anzalone, welcome to Decentralized Revolution. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you back on. Uh, there is uh, a lot in the news, foreign policy-wise, and uh, uh, I enjoy the work you do over at the Libertarian Institute and uh, uh, on your podcast. And uh, let's just get right into it. it. As we record this, it's August 31st, um, Afghanistan. It's one of those things where um, I, I hear everybody talking about it, like everybody, like people who normally don't talk about politics or foreign policy, uh, people who couldn't tell you the difference between the Taliban and Al Qaeda uh, have an opinion on this. And I just think it, uh, it must be that the that the corporate media is talking about this and spinning it in a certain way. Uh, I'd be curious as to uh, what your opinion is on what's actually going on versus what is being reported and how people are talking about it. Yeah. So, I mean, as of, uh, you know, from all the reporting that I'm seeing, the U S troops are out of Afghanistan as of August 30th, 2021. And so the occupation of that country is over. And I, I mean, from that standpoint, I'm kind of surprised. I, I didn't think that Biden would be able to stand up. I mean, we saw what happened with Trump when he tried to get out of Afghanistan. And as you know, many mistakes that 
were obviously made, um, not only in the past 20 years, but just talking about Biden in the particular, you know, since he became president, things that he could have done to have maybe made this a little bit smoother and a little bit less ugly for him. Uh, nonetheless, he has uh, significantly ended the, the U.S. war in Afghanistan. And that's that's a, a big accomplishment and something that, you know, um, I'm, I'm kind of surprised about. I thought he was going to get steamrolled. Um, uh, you could look back at the show from like a month, month and a half ago. Uh, I, you know, me and Will were still saying that, you know, we think there's a good chance that the, that the, you know, deep state will essentially do to Trump what, the, uh, to Biden what they did to Trump in Syria, where, you know, that he tried to leave and they said no. And they sent Lindsey Graham and Jack Keane in to, you know, yell at Trump. And, you know, they finally broke him down and they kept all the troops in Syria. And so I really thought something similar would happen. And, you know, through all of the mistakes and tragedies that have happened over the past uh, couple of months in Afghanistan, but particularly in the past couple of weeks as the U.S. was trying to get out of Kabul, um, it, it hasn't been that bad. You know, the, the Taliban are now in control of Afghanistan uh, for the past couple of weeks. They've shown a willingness to at least tolerate and work with Americans. I mean, get this. The U.S. has been at war with the Taliban for the past 20 years. And then once the Taliban take over the whole country but the Kabul airport, they, you know, just make it work with the Americans. And there, I don't think, was a single shot fire between the Americans and the Taliban all that time. Now, you know, not that there wasn't some violence outside the airport, but it wasn't between the U.S. and the the Taliban. And, you know, that that kind of stuff is, you know, significant as we're looking at what's happened here uh, and and everything like that. But, you know, there there have been definite mistakes by the Biden administration. Yeah. So are there I, I'm hearing a lot from people like it, like, like uh, the pastor at church even mentioned it. I don't know how well uh, informed he is, but. Uh, and I'm also seeing a little bit uh, in the Facebook feeds of conservative friends that, you know, the the people who worked with the American occupiers and uh, 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 Christians and things like that, that, that certain people are now being, you know, targeted by the Taliban for uh, collaboration or, or, or something else. Is there, is that sort of thing going on? So I, I got to say, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, there's some reports of it, uh, especially from the mainstream media. A lot of it is hard to corroborate. Also, it, you know, if there maybe is some retaliation by the Taliban against members of the Afghan National Army or the like former special forces, I, I mean, one, you know, th there are people within those groups that have tortured, you know, Taliban members over the years and have done horrific things to them. So, it, you know, if there's like some retribution or something like that going on, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all. And um, it may not, you know, if they are targeting people who are in the military, who not not just were like translators for Americans, but were active like Afghan army commandos who, you know, carried out these raids against the Taliban. I'd be less surprised that that stuff was going on. Uh, but as far as, you know, them just talking about carrying out blanket executions and stuff like that, I'm not seeing a whole lot. Uh, people are producing some videos. Uh, some of them certainly look like Afghanistan, certainly look like Taliban. But as far as anybody actually verifying this stuff is tough. And in fact, today I'm seeing a lot of people circulate these images on Twitter, uh, even from the you know libertarian community of a guy uh, that seems to be hanging from a Black Hawk helicopter. And they're alleging that um, the, you know, the, the Taliban flew some guy up there and pushed him out of a, a helicopter, you know, South American style. Uh, when in reality, I actually saw a longer clip. It's about a minute and 14 long of that video. And the guy clearly has a harness around him and is alive. He's like scratching his head and stuff like that. So I'm not saying that, you know, the Taliban aren't doing crazy things with these helicopters or anything like that. But, you know, some of these images are deceiving. And again, I don't think I don't want to stake my reputation and say like the Taliban aren't going to be brutal or aren't going to do bad things because uh, I'm sure they'll do some. But I guess I haven't seen convincing evidence that they're carrying out these blanket retaliation and, you know, massacres and, and, and stuff that that some people are claiming. Yeah, that's the uh, the tough position that we libertarians are sometimes put in that, you know, we um, are making the case for non-intervention. We're pointing out the folly of intervention 
And sometimes that comes across as, as we're defending uh, this regime or, or, or that regime. And of course, as libertarians, we were skeptical um, and more than skeptical. We're critical by its nature of just about every state. Um, but it's, I think it's important that, that we get things right. And one of the things that I, I still think that the, that the average you know man on the street here in America, like, I, I think they're just shockingly ill-informed about, you know, what the Taliban is, what, uh, uh, what motivates them. Uh, so let's, let's go back to the, to the, uh, uh, stone age, uh, in terms of the war in Afghanistan, uh, talk about what things were like in Afghanistan before nine 11. What's the difference between who are the Taliban? What's the difference between them, uh, and Al Qaeda? So we can understand who the Taliban is today. Yeah, so I guess the Taliban are a group of, of Pashtun um, Afghans for the most part, although, um, you know, I, I think the Duran line that separates uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan for some of the people that live around that line, you know, may not exactly feel like it, it represents them, you know, if they are in technically Pakistan, you know, they could be members of the Taliban, stuff like that. And in fact, you know, the, the Taliban receive a lot of support from uh, the Pakistani uh intelligence their isi uh, are the initials and it, through after like 9 11 the leadership of the taliban hung out in pakistan and so there you know there is that relationship uh but before 9 11 the pakistan or the the taliban excuse me were on a campaign uh to take over afghanistan and had captured the capital of city of kabul however uh there was still the northern alliance this group of uh the uh, ethnic minority groups of Afghanistan that together do make up a majority, but um, they are a minority and, uh, you know, in individual sets. And so, you know, they're called the Northern Alliance. And uh, pretty, I, I, you know, I think all these groups are essentially kind of in part leftovers from the U.S. backing of the Mujahideen in the 1980s. That's something that I, I see sometimes people like kind of misinterpret. Well, they'll say like, uh, Masood and Noor and Dostum, the, you know, these uh, ethnic minority law, war, warlords were uh, members of the Mujahideen. And then, oh, the Taliban are also remnants of the Mujahideen. There's some confusion there. And I, I think, you know, a lot of these guys are all uh, a part of the fighting force against the, the Soviet Union and the communist government that they they put in that country. But um, the, the Taliban uh, were, you know, taking over the country. They were seeking international recognition. Uh, they were doing this by cutting the poppy crop um and, and there wasn't very much uh poppy heroin growth in afghanistan uh right before the u.s invasion and was at its lowest number i think in probably the past 30 years at that time uh, but the taliban did have a, a pretty uh, brutal uh form of government they were loyal to the i think it's wali pashtu code uh which you, you know there there it's like part sharia law part tribal stuff uh there there are parts of this code that are certainly better than other things that have happened in Afghanistan, like they rejected the uh, bocce boy, the, you know, the having these uh, little tribal boys dance for older men, dress as women, and then get raped by those older men. Uh, they, they were opposed to that. Uh, they allow women to like actually technically own property, which was good because let's say somebody's husband dies, uh, you know, at least that woman can, you know, inherit her husband's stuff. And I'm not trying to say that rights for that, you know, the Taliban had great rights for women in the 1990s and stuff like that but you know these are some things now we also saw during those times the public executions for women uh you know the women having to be fully veiled um you know, they, they talk about horrible laws from that time, like, you know, uh, women can't refuse sets to their husbands or the, their husbands could, you know, refuse anything to them. Although a lot of these things are, you know, carried over into the Afghan government that the U.S. ends up uh, uh, propping up. But anyways, so that that was kind of the status of Afghanistan pre-9-11. Once the U.S. comes in uh, after 9-11 in October, I mean, the Taliban are done by the end of 2021, really. Uh, they, they were never that loyal to Osama bin Laden. And in fact, uh, when Clinton was president, they had, you know, 
given the U.S. some signals that they could come in and take bin Laden. And then once uh, 9-11 happened, uh, you know, part of the deal that the Taliban had with bin Laden was that bin Laden wouldn't plan any international terrorist attacks. And so they actually did offer to give him up to the Americans in October, November, December of 2000. And the U.S. refused because the Taliban might put conditions on it. I think the first time they offered, they say you had to provide us with evidence uh, for this because, you know, we do have law and I mean, you could feel how you feel about that, but that was their argument. Then they offered to turn uh, him over to another Muslim country, I guess, at least feeling like if they sent him there, that there would be, maybe be some kind of justice. And then at the end of it, they just offered to turn over to any American ally. And the U.S. refused every time, uh, you know, basically the the old thing where you have to offer absolute unilateral surrender and go away and then we're still going to kill you a little bit but you know maybe a little bit less and so uh they they end up botching it of course then they tried to raid osama bin laden i think this is in december of 2021 uh this is in tora bora afghanistan in that cave complex where there's i think 100 special forces and they're asking for reinforcements and the reinforcements are more concerned about fighting the taliban and establishing the bagram air base and supporting the northern alliance rather than getting their hands on osama bin laden and he has over the border to Pakistan, which it, 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 you know, this is portrayed like those old movies I used to watch with my grandpa on black and white, where the cops are chasing people uh, from Texas to Oklahoma. And when the, you know, bank robbers get over the border, the, the uh, cops have to actually pull the emergency brakes so they don't even get like one tire tread into Oklahoma or something, you know, some stupid thing like that. Like that's the way it's portrayed. And it's just not, I mean, Taliban and the, the Pakistan was a U.S. ally. I mean, we could have pursued them, but the, uh, you know, it kind of seems like like the the goal of the Bush administration wasn't to get Osama bin Laden at the time, and so it, imagine that how it went. <laughs> right. So, so the Taliban are basically the uh, the sort of uh, the the Pashtuns who are kind of a plurality as far as ethnic groups within Afghanistan. They're trying to control the whole country, but it's it's my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that they weren't were they sponsoring terrorism outside of Afghanistan? Did they have expansionist uh, goals at all? I mean, Osama bin Laden was in Afghanistan prior well, to 9-11. So, but but to, to get to get into the difference, they are not jihadists, right? right? And so that's like, I just, I want to establish that because people will say, oh, they were giving safe haven to Osama bin Laden. They're not international jihadists. They, you know, it's, they were instructing Bin Laden not to carry out this, you know, uh, an international terrorist attack. Again, I, I said that they had signaled to the Americans during the Clinton administration that uh, the Osama Bin Laden wasn't under their protection anymore because, you know, there, there was kind of this, I guess, code that the Taliban had where they gave uh, protection to uh, Muslims who were, you know, fighting a, different uh, fights uh, against other, you know, wars like uh, in India, the occupation of Kashmir or the Uyghurs in China, stuff like this. And so uh, some of the line kind of fit into that category and that's why he was there. But the Taliban, uh, while they have been I, I mean, absolute monsters for the past 20 years, you know, carrying out horrific suicide bombings, you know, killing children and, and stuff like this. Uh, they are not an international terrorist group. That, that's just not what their mission is. Their mission is to control Afghanistan. So and Al Qaeda, I get the impression that was kind of like a, uh, a house guest that that way overstayed their welcome. And the Taliban was not uh, got to a point where they realized they were a problem. And as you said, they wanted to, they were trying to get the Clinton administration to do something about it, whether or not they did enough. And, you know, that's, that's all debatable. But so in other words, they were not in lockstep with Al Qaeda. They didn't have a hand in uh, planning 9-11, anything like that. Is that correct? Right. And I, I mean, I, I can't say this for sure, but it seems an awful lot like uh, Osama bin Laden may not have ever had roots in Afghanistan at all if it wasn't for our operations in Afghanistan in the 1980s to begin with. And that seems like where maybe some of, you know, the, the base roots that Osama bin Laden did have in Afghanistan was fighting, uh, you know, on the side of the Mujahideen then and being involved in that. And so, 
yeah, I, I think that's where, just to say that, I think that's where a lot of the, you know, any connection that he had to Afghanistan, a lot of it comes from there. It, oh, I, I get frustrated with, uh, um, you know, I, I dislike Joe Biden probably more than the average American, but it's, uh, it's almost like uh, Obama and the, you know, the so-called horrible Iran deal that like he gets a lot of criticism, perhaps the most criticism for like the one thing he did right. And, and you know, Biden uh, leaving and it looking messy, like uh, how could it have ever been any different? And, and my, my uh, uh, question to people who are like, why are we, why are we pulling out? We should have done this differently. Like, what does it tell you that for 20 years we've occupied, we've tried to occupy a country, but um we couldn't uh, uh, spin up a government that could uh, take care of itself. The the Taliban at different times uh, over these last 20 years, uh, talk about how, how much um, uh, land territory was actually controlled by the Americans versus the Taliban versus others. It was never the case, uh, my understanding that the Americans had, you know, complete and, and then the Afghan, uh, you know, uh, government, they never had complete control over the country. Is that correct? I get, I mean, the Taliban did offer to surrender and really weren't fighting an insurgency in, I think like 2002 and 2003, all that much. I mean, the U S was carrying out operations and I'm sure the people were resisting the U S government, but I, I mean, it was just that the U S put in uh, the, the most corrupt people in charge and bat the Northern Alliance and all this stuff uh, that, made it so that they were going to like, you know, fight an insurgency and, you know, staying and trying to build a government. I, I guess just to point out that there may have been a time where the, the map you could have completely painted in the color of the United States, but it was never going to stay that way. Once the United States left, it was just a matter of, I, I guess the Taliban probably saw it as like a, a practical thing to wait out the Americans that they would leave rather than, you know, fighting and dying uh, and, you know, um, a war right away. But, you know, once the American state and their government was corrupt and they were putting all these, you know, horrific people in charge and uh, again, engaging in like the boy rape and stuff like that, that, you know, the insurgency came back. And I mean, 2006, 2007, you know, the Taliban were, were already retaking territory. Now, especially during the Obama years in the surge, you know, the Taliban are already, you know, taking territory. And while the surge is able to, you know, put a stop to that, the U S doesn't retake the whole terror, uh, whole country, even with 150,000 troops, the Taliban never stopped fighting at that point and controlled a lot of the countryside. And so I, I think really, you know, through the Trump years, what the Taliban were doing was not only negotiating with the U S uh, but also just putting themselves in better, better position uh, to take over the country. Once the U S ended up leaving uh, to the point where, you know, what Biden should have done is, you know, when he and Scott Horn explains this really well on Kennedy on Fox News, uh, he was on for a second time, uh, August 30th. You guys should check this one out. But he explains that if Biden had announced January 21st, uh, 2021, that he is sticking with the May 1st plan and we're getting out of the country then. Then when May 1st happens, the U.S. is out of the country, but the Taliban are still just picking up their fight against the Afghan National Army. And, and so this, you know, makes it so that the U.S. isn't leaving the country as the Taliban control Kabul. I also think that the U.S. could have done a lot of bureaucratic stuff better. Like up until a couple of weeks ago, they weren't sure how they were going to process uh, Afghans that didn't have passports and just disasters like this that didn't have to happen like the the kind of stupid red tape stuff that we had spent from libertarians that if i really want to do this right i think he probably could have avoided yeah. um yeah so is uh you mentioned that uh and i i agree i i was kind of surprised that that biden did follow through is there any um you know, theories as to why it did take this time. I have a, I have a, a possible theory, but I want to hear your uh, uh, thing, uh, your assessment first, but is there anything about Biden's foreign policy team or, you know, the change in personnel uh, or a change in some other situation that made uh, the deep state, I guess, for one reason or another, they didn't put enough pressure uh, to keep this thing going. So is there any indication or theory as to, 
as to why they finally gave in and stopped, you know, trying to blackmail whoever was president. I'm, it may be that Biden really didn't give him a choice and that he was really sticking through with it. It seems like they really tried to drag their feet on the whole issue, the State Department and the Defense Department. Um, I, I think part of this is that Biden is serious about getting troops out of Afghanistan. I don't think he uh, really wants to be responsible for America's dying in Afghanistan. Uh, during his one of his speeches about Afghanistan, I forget which one, he mentions his son, Bo, who isn't hunters the the current one Bo's the one who passed away a few years ago this is like a, a decorated uh he was pretty decorated in the military uh but uh, joe biden kind of acknowledged he didn't say it explicitly but he said that his son deployed and then got cancer and died and uh he got it from a burn pit everybody's pretty sure about yeah. that and so um I think that's a part of it that, you know, he's already lost one son to this and just doesn't see any value in Afghanistan at all. I mean, he was pushing against Obama surging so many troops into Afghanistan when he was vice president. And uh, I, I think he felt like Obama got rolled by the deep state in that case. And and so I, I think he, this was just one thing he said that this is the way I'm doing it. And yeah. I, I mean, one of the one of the things about it, they are really hanging it as a noose around his neck. Maybe that's the reason that they let it happen. I mean, uh, the Washington Post is running op-eds by Robert Kagan, uh, the Wall Street Journal by Paul Wolfowitz. These are, you know, neocon architects uh, of the Iraq and Afghan wars. And they're, they're trying to, you know, argue that we should have stayed and that terrorist attack is going to happen and all this. And so, I, I mean, after a 20-year failed intervention, I guess one thing that you could do is just, you know, again, you know, teach all the other presidents as a lesson that if you leave a war, we're, we're going to make it look really bad for you. And right. I think there's been some some accomplishing that. Although, you know, we got to point this out, the American people still support leaving Afghanistan. They, they oppose the withdrawal. Even the Democrats oppose the way Biden and handled the withdrawal, but they do support leaving. Yeah, they, they don't support the occupation anymore, but they, and I think naturally, I think there's probably a little bit of uh, guilt uh, on the part of people is seeing the chaos and uh, basically, you know, knowing deep down that that we made a bad situation worse for most people in Afghanistan and, and seeing the uh, images <clears throat> and seeing that come to a head, I think, um, I think people realize, and it's good to know that they're still, they're, they're not reversing it there, but they're, I think they're expressing, uh, guilt over their former support for it, um, whether they know it or not. But, um, so my, my, another one of my theories is that, <clears throat> sorry, that, uh, the, you know, the military industrial complex or whatever you want to call it, I think maybe they kind of said, okay, we, you know, we've sucked as much juice out of this, uh, uh, a piece of fruit as, as we can possibly get. And so I'm worried that they're, uh, you know, casting their gaze around the world to, to see where else uh, we could uh, go and, and set up one of these, uh, you know, interminable occupations so they can keep, you know, keep billing uh, uh, the government for things. So what, what does Syria look like? And then I, I eventually I want to get over to uh, uh, China and, and Taiwan. I've heard some speculation that, yeah, maybe that the the military the military industrial complex is like, hey, we're gonna do this China thing at some point, so we might as well uh, uh, start harvesting our resources, pulling back in some places to to get ready to uh, to do something uh, on that front. So, what what do you think Biden and his team uh, uh, are thinking about uh, uh, or, or looking at on the horizon? Yeah, so I think uh, I'll just say I think this is bigger than Biden and his team generally, uh, because I think generally what they're looking at is this great power competition and the idea that uh, the American people are just exhausted with the Middle East wars. And so rather than, you know, trying these occupations, we're going to end the forever wars, but we're not going to cut the military budget because now we have to worry about China and Russia. And then, you know, they'll go Iran and Venezuela and, uh, you know, North Korea and stuff too they're concerned about but you know they say they're done with these uh nation building exercises i'm not quite so sure especially because and, and this is specific to the the biden administration these are the you know jv foreign policy team from the 
Obama administration years. These are the people that lied to humanitarian intervention that went in and kicked over Libya. And of course, you know, they didn't learn any lessons from Libya. The only lesson that any of these people have ever learned is that Rwanda happened. And so if the U.S. intervenes, we can make everything in the world better because mm -hmm. the mistake of Rwanda was doing nothing. And, and, and so you have like Samantha Power and Anthony Blinken and Jake Sullivan and uh, General Austin, even who are, again, all people from the Obama administration who are higher ranking, who now have even higher ranking positions. And one of the places you mentioned Syria, they don't want to leave Syria. Biden says we're not leaving Syria. They put out this uh, agreement with the Iraqi government to say that the U.S. mission in Afghanistan or in Iraq is changing uh, bad to training is, uh, I believe, advising a train missions only. Uh, I'm sure that'll get stretched and the U.S. troops will be in the same role they've you know, been in this whole time in that country. Uh, Biden said he was ending the war in Yemen. He's not doing that. Uh, he seems to have uh, escalated and ramped up the drone strikes again in Somalia. But the real place I think they're looking at and have their eye on is uh, this area of northern Ethiopia on the border with Eritrea called Tigray. And that, you know, I don't want to get into the whole bad story here, but uh, Samantha Power has gone there and she's one of the main hawks that provoked the Libya intervention and has said that, you know, she sees uh, this language of genocide and that there's starvation going on. And not to say that there, there's not bad things going on in Ethiopia, but the situation is a whole lot more complicated. And uh, I'll do an episode of my show on it soon. But uh, the. And just to say that, I think that's one of the places, uh, Tigray, Ethiopia, to really keep your eye on. I think okay. the U.S. has some, the Biden administration has some plans to crack down there. Yeah. Uh, um, so I, I wanted to uh, talk some about China and Taiwan. And uh, people who have listened to the podcast know that, you know, I have a, a soft spot for Taiwan. My, my wife's family is from there. My mother-in-law is over there. I want to move there someday and maybe retire there or something. I love it. Um, but uh, as a libertarian, I, I don't think that the, the United States should, uh, 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 you know, pledge to go to war for Taiwan, which, which is, you know, it's a, that's a tough one for me. Um, talk about, okay. So we've been hearing uh, over the spring and summer, uh, these sorts of stories kind of come up all the time for most of my lifetime that every year or two that, oh, that the Chinese are conducting exercises close to Taiwan, uh, et cetera. Give us a very quick, um, you know, uh, uh, assess or just kind of a look back at what Taiwan status is, why it exists in its current form, and then what is currently going on between uh, China and Taiwan. Yeah, real quick. And if people want like a, a lot more on this, uh, there's a great U former U.S. diplomat, uh, Charles Freeman, who writes on this quite a bit uh, at like the Quincy Institute. So if you want like a lot more detail, uh, please go check him out because I, I don't do as well with the nuance and all this. But um, particularly, I think it's 1979 that the U.S. officially changes its stance. Uh, this is during the Nixon administration on China. Um, and they adopt this policy where rather than recognizing the government of Taiwan as the official government of China, they recognize uh, the Mao Zedong government of mainland China as the government of China. And that has some pretty big like geopolitical implications because I believe it changed to actually sat on the uh, for the permanent seat yeah. of the UN National Security Council. Yeah, and let's go. Let's go back one second. That it, it, uh, in 1948, the Chinese uh, communists took over and the nationalist government, uh, Chiang Kai-shek and those guys, they basically, you know, went, you know, 90 miles uh, across the, the sea to Taiwan and set up a government there. And so from, uh, from then, the U.S. officially recognized the Republic of China, which is in Taiwan, as China. And so, the, yeah, the Nixon switch in the 70s switched that. So uh, Taiwan has always been claimed uh, elite, you know, the communist government claims sovereignty over Taiwan. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I believe Taiwan still, or at least there, I have seen people in Taiwan say like they, they still believe in one China too, and that, you know, they're just the correct government. Although I don't know if that's like the official position of the Taiwanese government. I, I think that's been changing. And I've seen some things that it's, it's one of those things where the older a person is, the more likely they are to support some sort of reunification, you know, a deal with China, something like that. But, uh, you know, I think people sort of Gen X and younger tend to, uh, I think the majority of them now identify as Taiwanese and recognize that they're a de facto independent state and kind of want to move in, in that direction. So I think the, the uh, Chiang Kai-shek's party um, has, it, it still exists, but the, there's like a social Democrat party that's kind of the counterpart to them that are more... Uh, independence minded. I, I don't think they, uh, anybody wants to, and the Chiang Kai-shek party is the one that kind of, I think wants to uh, explore a deal. They're more amenable to that. But I think everybody is always a little bit afraid to, they don't want to provoke China um, uh, over this. So I think that's shifting as far as demographically uh, the people there wanting to be independent. And I think they saw what happened with Hong Kong and uh, I think a lot of people are like, oh, well, China is obviously not going to honor any any deals with us to, to, to you know, give us – if they offer us limited autonomy, they're probably not going to follow through on that long term. So why should we – so why should we uh, cut a deal? So I think the, the chances of a, of a deal that Taiwan is willing to get into is uh, – grows less and less every day. Yeah. Now, I, I will say, I feel like some of this is uh, self-fulfilling prophecy on the part of the Hawks, where they, they continue to warn about the need to militarize Taiwan. And in response to that, it, it kind of creates a need for China to continue to militarize and then to, you know, have the plan and ability to militar militarily seize Taiwan. Because uh, from the Chinese perspective, if the U.S. is looking at you as its main competitor and its main challenge, you can't really let it set up a uh, just straight up like base 90 miles off of your coast on on Taiwan. You know why I mean? Uh, just like the U.S. had a problem with the you know Soviets doing it in Cuba. So uh, I, I kind of see how, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of ways to look at how this has happened. And I'm sure it has to do with like the military militarization in China, what they've done in Hong Kong. But I'm sure from the Chinese perspective, it's also been the increasing U.S. influence and uh, military presence in Taiwan, the Taiwan Strait, the South China Sea, uh, the Philippines looking at, you know, the, the U.S. It, it has like really, really ramped up its anti uh, China military presence in the region going as far as looking at creating something called quad NATO between India, Australia, Japan, and the U S to counter China. And uh, of course, all of this, uh, all these plans are, are built around, uh, you know, competing against Chinese claims to Hong Kong, uh, the islands in the South China sea and also Taiwan. And so all this kind of gets wrapped up into one issue. And, um, I think it really complicates uh, things for a lot of people because now it's either, you know, you're for, you know, for China and against China. And uh, this includes, you know, their dispute in the Himalayas with India, their disputes over reefs with the Philippines and, uh, you know, the issues with Japan over the Senkakun Islands, Hong Kong and Taiwan. If you wrap that all up into one issue, I think it more it makes it more complicated to ne negotiate on all these things individually, too. And I, I think that's maybe a disadvantage the U.S. has actually put the people of Taiwan in in the long term uh, that China is going to see the only option as militarization because um India is very militarized. China, uh, Japan is willing to fight over the Senkakus. Uh, the Philippines want U.S. backing to fight over, I think it's the Waldorf Reef or whatever it is, and over the fishing boats issues there. And um, it, it really adds, a, you know, a lot of uh, other complexities. to. It's just not trying to figure out a way uh, for Taiwan to not feel threatened uh, militarily uh, take over by China anymore. So has the Biden administration been saying anything about uh, uh, that? Um, were they the ones who talked about this this alliance over there? Or where, where do you see Biden? How do you see him dealing with, with all that? 
So the pivot to Asia started in the uh, Obama administration, and then Trump really picked it up. And obviously, he was a very, very anti-China president. And despite uh, everybody criticizing Trump uh, for you know his anti-China racism, causing all these attacks against Chinese people and everything, if we actually watch the debates between Trump and Biden, they were both trying to out hawk each other on the China issue. And so you know this is just, it's kind of like Russia where it's just the deep state momentum uh, of the of the whole thing. Biden has ramped up like the U.S. passages through the Taiwan Strait. You know, I, no matter how you feel about the issue, I think it's pretty absurd for a U.S. Coast Guard ship to be sailing through the Taiwan Strait. I mean, this is, you know, on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, uh, what, 80, 90 miles off of China, China's coast that you have a U.S. Coast Guard ship. Those kind of things are going to provoke China to do some kind of action on their own. And I think one of the things that China has been doing a lot recently is flying uh, military planes through Taiwan's Air Identification Defense Zone, AIDZ. And this isn't actually over the island of Taiwan, but um, all the governments of the world like draw little boxes around their countries and say, like, if you enter this box in the air, you do this. If you do it in sea, you do this. And so these are technical violations of what, you know, Taiwan says is their air defense. And where I, I don't know if China really can't operate, but I think where they're supposed to, like, announce that they're going to be there and stuff beforehand and they're not doing that. And then both sides carry out war games. Uh, Taiwan carries out war games with the U.S. China carries out war games. And, it, you know, they're, they're done provocatively on both sides. You know, China will carry out war games in the waters, you know, surrounding Taiwan to kind of let, you know, Taiwan know that the military threat exists. Yeah. Um, is, is China, uh, are, are these hawks on China? You mentioned correctly that that both Biden and Trump uh, are are sort of talking tough. This pivot uh, to getting, I think, people used to the idea of the U.S. being involved over there is happening. What is the real? Um, what are China's actual intentions and and actions? Are they, of course, again, they're horrible. It's a communist government. It's um, as a libertarian, I'm not saying they're not dangerous and not evil. Um, but are they are they expansionist or what are they wanting uh, uh, to do uh, in, in the coming decade? So, I, I mean, I, I don't actually know exactly what they want to do. But if we kind of look at what's been going on, uh, they, you know, they have been looking to exert more control over what our traditional are, what the what the, you know, communist government of China sees as traditional Chinese territories, whether that's uh, Tibet, uh, Xinjiang, that's where the Uyghurs are, uh, Hong Kong and Macau, and then uh, Taiwan, the South uh the South China Sea and all this, uh, you know, that that is something that the Chinese government uh, has been doing. Now, saying that, does that mean that they're going to send in the troops to Hong Kong or Taiwan? I, I don't know. I mean, this would be a pretty complex like invasion and would be very costly for the Chinese. The Taiwanese do have an advanced military. And uh, I mean, I, I think that the uh, independence uh, candidate, the, the separatist candidate, whatever, however you want to phrase it, of Taiwan has uh, won some elections. And so that suggests to me that there would be a pretty large group of uh uh, Taiwanese that would be willing to fight to keep their independence should it, it come that route. Now, one thing I think from the American perspective that's really important to point out, I don't know what we could do if China really wanted to take uh, Taiwan short of like an all-out war between the U.S. and China, which it, it kind of can't happen because of the nuclear weapons. And so the, one of the reasons I really oppose the U.S. taking this militarized approach here and why I think it actually made to, uh, somewhat worse the situation for Taiwan is because the U.S. is bluffing and China isn't. If China wants to, it can militarily retake Taiwan. It would be hugely expensive and costly. If the U.S. wanted to, I don't know. This is, again, an island right off the coast of China on the other side of the world. China does have uh, what they, they've built their uh, military 
on defending the uh, on defending the Chinese homeland in the seas it, it, around it, and so they have missiles uh, that can take out U.S. ships like several hundred miles off uh, off the coast. Uh, they have air defense systems to take out U.S. air defense ability. Now, this is any way to say that China has like any ability to invade the U.S. and I, I think they would have a hell of a time invading Taiwan. But for the U.S. to come and try to break a Chinese uh, blockade of Taiwan and to try to take that island back from China when it is just off of China's coast, I don't think is actually possible unless the U.S. is, again, willing to go to outright war, uh, bomb significantly the Chinese mainland, which means nuclear warfare. And I, I don't think the Americans are willing to do that, where I think China could take Taiwan without going to nuclear warfare. And so... Uh, just if you look at kind of where it is in the world, and I know Americans like to be like, rah, rah, we have the best military. And again, I'm not saying that China could like invade Hawaii or anything like that. But if we're just looking at this one island off of China's coast and it went to blows, I, I think that it doesn't go nuclear, China wins. And that's a real problem for the U.S. And so uh, maybe look for more diplomatic situations to all this rather than military ones. Yeah, that's my ultimate hope for this is that all parties involved will see that war is bad for business and that they'd rather just make money. And that if we could, you know, if uh, China could uh, uh, could live with that indefinitely, no matter what they um you know, they, you know, they, they, they always get uh, upset when they got upset when some Olympic announcer said Taiwan instead of Chinese Taipei, you know? So I think if we could kind of keep stroking China's ego and uh, 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 maybe find a diplomatic thing, that's my, that's my hope uh, uh, for, for what can happen over there. Just have just a few minutes uh, before I ask you to, to plug what you're doing and everything. You, you mentioned Russia briefly. Uh, you know, in the wake of, you know, the, 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 the made up Russia plot, you know, uh, with Trump and all that, um, what is the Biden administration? Uh, how are they dealing with Russia? What's going on uh, on that front? Oh, boy. <laughs> so the, the real concern here, I think, is Ukraine, where the Biden administration seems to be picking up the old Obama administration policy, where uh, in 2014, they did a coup d'etat in Ukraine, and this kicked off a civil war in the country. Uh, Crimea ends up being annexed by Russia, and there's still a uh, region of uh, Crimea, Donbass, that is, or not Crimea, excuse me, of Ukraine, the Donbass region that borders Russia, that is still uh, in the hands of, uh, and still controlled by people in opposition uh, to the Ukrainian central government. And so at the start of the Biden administration, there was real talk from the Ukrainians about like, you know, we're going to go in and we're going to take that out. And, you know, Russia kind of said, no, you aren't, because they bat the separatists there. And uh, while I don't think Russia is willing like to go to war to annex that territory, and in, in fact, in the past when those uh, ter the Donbass region of Ukraine has offered or has requested to Russia to, to be reabsorbed into the Russian Federation, uh, Russia declined that offer. They said, no, you're staying a part of Ukraine. Um, but they're also not willing to let the Ukrainian army come in and uh, just take that back over either. And the same thing with Crimea. Uh, Biden gave some pretty worrying uh, statements to the Ukrainian president at the beginning of his administration. Uh, but since it just seems like, you know, for the most part, the, the media has been too busy and Biden has been too busy to talk about the situation. So, so someone almost has been on the back burner, but the U.S. has been carrying out huge war games in the Black Sea and in Eastern Europe throughout this whole thing, kind of just the status quo going on, which is interesting. You know, you can't go to your local supermarket if you're not vaccinated, but 20,000 troops to Eastern Europe, no big deal, right? Just uh, fly some planes around and warships around, all this other crazy stuff they're doing. So, uh, I, I mean, just real quickly, I guess that's kind of a summary of this. I, I mean, the, the tensions are, are still there. Fortunately, it doesn't seem like, you know, Biden has been interested in stoking them. However, uh, with the the HOTS losing on Afghanistan, they're looking for other places to win. Uh, there was a... Um, what military industrial complex contracting firm, I think it's CAIA, uh, that put out their report and said, hey, profits are down this quarter because the war in Afghanistan is ending. And so um, 
they didn't say this, but I think, you know, what we should all understand that to mean is they're going to be looking for profits elsewhere. And Ukraine is certainly one place that they, they think they could find them. Yeah. You, um, you mentioned Hawks, uh, uh, in, uh, talking to the administration, just one, this is the last question I promise. Uh, is there, are there identifiable factions in the, the Biden team or, or is there a neocon wing? Is there, uh, you know, something else, um, it, or, or are all they are, or are they all kind of on the same page? Yeah. So I, I, there, there certainly is, uh, some neocons, uh, Victoria Newland is the wife of Robert Kagan, who is this horrible warmonger who just wrote a piece in the Washington post, uh, telling Americans that not every foreign policy d- defeat should be somewhere we look for a lesson and to hold people accountable. <laughs> so that's the kind of war hawk he is. No lessons from Afghanistan. Uh, the kind of guy that says, Hey, that war kept you safe all these years. No more nine elevens, right guys. That That's what we need. And so the, that faction certainly exists. Uh, Jade Sullivan is the national security advisor. I think he is uh, like kind of from the Hillary Clinton camp. Um, there are a lot of humanitarian interventionist types. Uh, Sam Power uh, is kind of my, the top of that list. I think representative of a lot of people. Um, there are some like Robert Molly's in the administration. He was uh, somebody who negotiated uh, with a, a ROM for the JCPOA during the Obama administration. So he's somebody kind of better. Uh, but then his assistant is Richard Nephew, who was the uh, Obama's uh, guy who put like maximum pressure campaigns and sanctions together. So it, it's kind of a mix. I think uh, the people who most represent Biden in all of it are Lloyd Austin, the Secretary of Defense and Annie Blinken, the Secretary of State. Um, so so those are kind of the people I look towards most representing Biden's opinion, although I think they are deep state actors too, and uh, to some extent weren't too happy with Biden actually ending this war. Uh, but I, I guess, you know, as a quick breakdown, that's, that's the way the best yeah. I see it in some of the key actors in the administration. All right, great. Um, it, it's been a pleasure having you on. Uh, tell people what you're up to elsewhere, how they can engage with uh, with what you're doing. Uh, antiwar.com. I'm the opinion editor, so check out the viewpoints. But, of course, read the news section every day. Uh, that's the great Jason Camp. Uh Jason, Dave DeCamp and Jason Ditz uh, right there. Uh, Libertarian Institute, I'm the news editor, so I put out the news roundup every day and also do my podcast, uh, co-hosted with Will Porter, Conflicts of Interest, three days a week. Um, and then, let's see, the, yeah, Conflicts of Interest is the last thing, the podcast. Yeah, we'll put uh, links to that uh, up appreciate on it. the show page. Kyle, appreciate having you on. Thanks for having me on. There you have it. I'd like to thank Kyle Anzalone for his time and wisdom for coming back on Decentralized Revolution and for all his hard work over at antiwar.com, the Libertarian Institute, and on the Conflicts of Interest podcast, which you should definitely check out. Links to that and uh, some other of Kyle's work over at decentralizedrevolution.com slash 62. Uh, also coming very soon. I've already got it recorded. I'm editing it today as well. Uh, episode 63 with guest Corey DeAngelis, who's really doing a great job on education reform. He always is killing it on Twitter and elsewhere, blowing up a lot of the, the myths we hear from the corporate media and uh, the teachers unions. Thanks to Dave versus Goliath for all the music you hear on Decentralized Revolution. And thanks to everyone who subscribes to our email list and gives to Mises Pack at TakeHumanAction.com. And everyone who shares, rates, reviews, and subscribes to Decentralized Revolution. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.